it's a pleasure to be here giving this talk about phase transitions and uh, nonlinear PDEs. So as Diogo was saying in the introduction to the masterclass, um, one of the things that we try to do when we study nonlinear PDEs is to understand the behavior of the solutions to these equations that we cannot, of course, solve explicitly. So we want to say if uh, the solutions are smooth, if they are smooth, how smooth they are, uh, or uh, on the contrary, if they develop singularities and uh, we want to say something about the nature of these singularities. So I'll be talking about the very classical three boundary problem, the problem of ice melting into water. So this is a free boundary problem because there is this surface uh, between the ice and the water that uh, is unknown a priori. So part of the problem is to understand the behavior of this interface between ice and water. So there are many versions of this problem, which is called, by the way, the Stefan problem. And the most simple is the one phase Stefan problem, in which we assume that the temperature in the ice remains constant and equal to zero. So we have the ice region where U is zero, so there's nothing we need to, to understand here. U is constant and zero. And then in the water, the temperature obeys the, say, classical heat equation. So time derivative of the temperature U equals Laplacian U. And then we have to understand how the interface moves, how it behaves. And for this, we have the so-called Stefan condition. So the interface moves according to this law. So if we pick a point at the interface, the velocity of this point is given by minus the gradient of the temperature. So if you look at this uh, in a 1D scenario, so the temperature is zero here on ice and it's some positive function in water. So we take the derivative at this point and we just take the opposite of this, uh, of, this, uh, of this vector. And this is what drives the motion of this interface. Now, a more complicated scenario appears when we also consider that the temperature is not constant in the ice. So now we have two regions, the ice region and the water region, where we have a PDE. I'm going to complicate things a little bit. So I'm, instead of the heat equation, I'm going to consider now the parabolic P Laplace equation, which is this PDE. So of course, for P equals two, this is just this is just the Laplace operator, and we recover the heat equation. But this is a more general um, equation for P greater than two. So now the PDE has to be satisfied both in the ice and in the water. And again, we have a condition, the Stefan condition on the interface that tells us that the normal component of the jump of the heat flux, which is now the gradient of u to the power p minus two gradient of u, is proportional to the normal velocity of the free boundary. And the constant of proportionality is this L, which is called the latent heat of the phase transition. So what is this? This is the amount of heat you must give to the system for the phase transition to occur. So if you, if you look at the temperature as a function of the energy, so if you have a unit mass of ice and you start heating this uh, unit mass of ice, what you see is that the temperature goes up until it reaches a certain value, let's say zero, and then you continue to heat and the temperature remains at zero for a while, after which it starts going up again. So this amount of heat you have to give to the system for its transition from ice to water is precisely what we call the latent heat of the phase transition. Now, this picture also unlocks the right way to look at the problem from the weak perspective. So if we invert this, uh, this function, we obtain not a function anymore, because now to the point zero, it corresponds an interval, not a point. This is what we call a maximal monotone graph. So it depicts the energy as a function of the temperature. And as I was saying, 
this unlocks the way, the right way to look at, 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 the, at the problem from the weak perspective, uh, incorporating in a single PDE, both the, the, the equations that hold in the liquid and the solid phases and the free boundary condition. And the right equation is this equation that might resemble at first sight the, the, the P Laplace equation, but where here we don't have the time derivative of U, but we have the time derivative of V. And V is not the temperature, but the energy. So V is a choice in this maximum monotone graph. So V is an element of this graph here. So it coincides with U when U is negative. It coincides with U plus L when U is positive, but at zero, it is something between zero and L, okay? So this is the right equation to, when we formulate the problem in the weak form. And so we write this maximum monotone graph gamma as the identity plus L times this age of U, which is age is the heavy side graph that I, that I depicted here, okay? So how do we solve the problem? The, the idea is that we have here two main difficulties in this PD. So the first one is that the equation is degenerate. So this means that at critical points where the gradient is zero, the say the modulus of ellipticity of the equation, which is grad u to the power p minus two, if p is greater than two, this is also going to be zero. So this somehow destroys the elliptic structure of the principal part in the equation or the parabolicity of the parabolic equation. And so one of the challenges is to understand to what extent this compromises the regularity properties of the solution. Because for parabolic equations, we know that uh, the equation has a regularizing effect. So solutions are in principle smooth, but here this parabolicity nature is destroyed at the points where the gradient is zero. And we want to see if this in fact carries over to destroy the regularity properties of the solution or not. But the other feature of the PDE is that because we have here not the time derivative of U, but the time derivative of V, and V is a function that belongs to gamma of U, we also have a singularity. Because this gamma, because we have a jump here, the derivative of gamma at zero is going to be infinity. So here we have the time derivative of V. So roughly speaking, we have, so dt of gamma of u, this is gonna be say gamma prime of u dt u. And so when u is zero, the derivative is going to be infinity. So, the equation has a degeneracy in the principal part and a singularity in the time part. So we have these two big difficulties to overcome when studying the regularity properties of the solutions. So we want to understand if the temperature remains, for example, continuous across the free boundary or if it jumps, okay? So this is the first challenge. Now, the way we solve the problem is by regularization. So we cannot deal with this maximum monotone graph. We have to somehow approximate the problem by a smoother problem. And for this, what we do is that we regularize this heavy side graph. So we consider uh, a smooth approximation of this graph. Okay, so this is epsilon. And we study the problem for this age epsilon here. So now everything is fine. There's no singularity at zero. And uh, we study the problem, this approximate problem for this regularization of, of the maximum monotone graph. So we see that we have two bounds for this gamma of epsilon or for its derivative. This is of course greater or equal than one. So we have a good lower bound, which is independent of epsilon. But the upper bound for the derivative of gamma epsilon is going to be one, which is the derivative of the identity, plus L, 
multiplied by the, the derivative of H epsilon. And of course, you see, if we have an approximation of this type, the derivative is going to be of the order one over epsilon. So this means that as epsilon goes to zero, this upper bound on the derivative of gamma epsilon is going to blow up. And uh, this is a problem. Why is this a problem? Because what we want to do is to study this approximate problem and then obtain estimates that are independent of epsilon so that we can pass to the limit as epsilon goes to zero and obtain estimates for the limit function, which will be a solution of the original problem, right? So as epsilon goes to zero, this approximation of the, of the heavy side graph converges to the heavy side graph. And so the solutions u epsilon of the approximate problem will converge to the solution of our original problem. So our goal is to show that the sequence of approximate solutions is on the one hand uniformly bounded. This is something that we can do more or less easily. And we also want to show that the solution is equicontinuous so that we can use Ascoli Arzela theorem to prove that in the limit, the, the, the solution is going to be continuous like the, the approximate solutions. Now, to prove that uh, uh, solutions are equicontinuous, we have to show that they are continuous with a uniform modulus of continuity, which means that it is independent of epsilon. And that's where the fact that this upper bound depends on epsilon in a bad way can be dangerous, say, in our, in our approach. So um, we really need to make sure that uh, we can derive estimates for the solution that do not depend on epsilon. And so we have to avoid uh, using this upper bound because, uh, I mean, this is something that we cannot get rid of as epsilon goes to zero because this goes to infinity. Okay, very good. So we want to study the continuity of a solution at the point. And for that, we're going to use the George's method. So the idea is this. We're going to pick a point in space-time, and we're going to build a sequence of cylinders in space and time that will shrink to the point. We're going to measure the oscillation of the solution in these cylinders. So the oscillation is the difference between the supremum and the infimum of the solution. And we're going to show that as the cylinders shrink to the point, the oscillations that we measure converge to zero. This is a way of showing that the solution is continuous at that point. So if we, on the other hand, are able to show exactly how the oscillation goes to zero, we derive a modulus of continuity. So if we can show that the oscillation goes to zero independently of epsilon, then we prove equicontinuity of the sequence of solutions. Now, the implementation of this method is based, of course, on estimates for the solution, in this case, for the approximate solutions. So we have to derive estimates, and we want to derive estimates that do not depend on the approximating parameter epsilon. Now, Deriving these estimates, so this is just a picture of the sequence of cylinders in space-time. So here, of course, this is, this is going to be space in this direction here, space and time here. So these are parabolic boxes in, in space-time. And um, so I was saying that... Uh, in order to derive estimates um, independent of epsilon, we have to look at expressions of this form. So this looks horrible. Just don't worry about the way it looks for now. The only point I want to stress is that here on these estimates, which are basic estimates that will allow us to, to, to do this reduction of the oscillation, we have power two here, power p here and here, and power one there. Okay, we don't see it. Let me show it there. So we have three different powers, two P and one. Now, of course, these two terms with power P are here because we have the P Laplace operator in the principal part. So if we have the heat equation, we would have two instead of this P. So this is one of the difficulties of the problem. Um, now, everything works fine. 
and we can prove reduction of, uh, of the oscillation uh, in, say, a standard fashion if these powers are the same. So if we have some sort of homogeneity in these uh, inequalities. So the difficulty in our problem is that these powers are different. So if we had the heat equation, for example, we would have two there, two there, two there, two here, and two here. So we would have two everywhere and everything would work just fine. But now we have different powers. And I want to, under to, to understand why we get power one here and here and not power two. And this is because we want to have these constants independent of epsilon. So we could have power two here and here. We could, we could have two in these two terms if the constant depends on epsilon. But if we want the constant to be independent of epsilon, then the price that we have to pay is the appearance of this power one here in the estimates. Let me show you why. Why do we get power one here? Now, this comes from the, the term involving the time derivative. So for this term, what we have now for the regularized problem, remember, this would be the time derivative of V, which is an element of gamma of U. So in the case of the regularized problem, the gamma of U, the gamma epsilon of U is now a function. So this is the time derivative of the gamma epsilon of U epsilon precisely. So in order to, to obtain these estimates, what we do is that we multiply by this test function. So this uh, u epsilon minus k minus is the negative part of u epsilon minus k. k is just a constant. And so this is the negative part of what's inside. This means that this is zero if what's inside is positive, and it's negative what's inside if, it's, if it is negative. So when this is not zero, this is k minus u epsilon whenever u epsilon is less than k. So we have to deal with this term. And uh, the first thing I want to observe is that you can write it in this form. So we can write this as the time derivative of this thing inside the parentheses times zeta to the p. Why is this true? You see that here, what you get basically when you do the derivative, you get gamma epsilon prime of u epsilon, time derivative of u epsilon, and then u epsilon minus k minus c to the p, okay, with a minus there. And of course, when this is not zero, this is just gamma epsilon prime of u epsilon, dt of u epsilon. So as I said, this is k minus u epsilon, c to the p, okay, with a minus. Now let's look at this term, okay? So when we take the derivative of this, what you get? When u epsilon minus k minus is not zero, it is k minus u epsilon. So if we take the derivative of this, we get the derivative of k minus u epsilon, k is a constant, we get minus the derivative with respect to t of u epsilon. So this is what comes from taking the derivative of this guy. And then we have to replace here s by this value, right? So we get gamma prime epsilon of k minus what? Minus u epsilon minus k minus, which is k minus u epsilon. So we get minus plus u epsilon here inside, and then we have u epsilon minus k minus. Okay, so this cancels, and what we get is this. So it's minus dt of u epsilon, gamma epsilon prime of u epsilon, and then here, when this is not zero, this is k minus u epsilon. Okay, and then we have this guy, c to the p. And this should be exactly the same thing as this, right? So dt of u epsilon, dt of u epsilon, gamma epsilon prime of u epsilon here, k minus u epsilon, c to the p, and the minus there. Okay, so everything matches, and this is precisely this thing, right? So this equality is justified. And now if we have it in this form, we can integrate by parts, okay? 
So we're gonna have this integral in space evaluated at t, which is this term, minus the this evaluated at minus tau, which is the, the inferior limit of this integral. And then minus, we pass to the derivative to this c to the p, we get p, c to the p minus one c t, and here we are left with this term. So this term here appears both with the positive sign here and the negative sign there. So if we need to get an estimate for this, we have to estimate this from above and from below, okay? Now, estimating it from below is fine because the gamma epsilon prime, remember, is bounded below by one. So this guy is greater or equal to one, and so everything is greater or equal than the integral of s, and so we get this square divided by two. So this is why we get here this term on the left-hand side with a square. Now, if we want to bound this term from above, now we have a problem because the bound from above of the derivative of gamma epsilon, remember this is of the order of one over epsilon. So this is one plus the L divided by epsilon. So if, if I use this bound, I'm gonna end up with a constant here. So the constant that I'm gonna get here will depend on epsilon in this way. So it will be something like one over epsilon. So when epsilon goes to, in, to zero, this will go to infinity and I have no uh, surviving estimates when I pass to the limit. So I have to be able to bound this from above independently of epsilon. So I cannot use this bound on the derivative. And the trick to do this is to understand that I have here this S and I'm integrating between zero and this positive quantity. So I can just take the S outside, replacing it by its maximum value, which is exactly this. And what I'm left with inside is the gamma epsilon prime, and this I can integrate. And so what I get is, so this guy remains the same here and here, and then I get the value of gamma epsilon at this subtracted by the value here. So I get, remember again, when this is not zero, this is k minus u epsilon. So I get gamma epsilon at k minus k plus u epsilon. So it's the gamma epsilon at u epsilon. It's here with the minus sign because when I integrate, I have, of course, the primitive has a minus sign because here it's minus s and not s. Okay, and then the value at zero is gonna be just gamma epsilon at k, okay, which is here with a positive sign because of the same reason. And now, although the gamma epsilon prime is not uniformly bounded, the gamma epsilon will be uniformly bounded because our solutions are uniformly bounded. And so the gamma epsilon in uh, the set where the solutions are bounded, this is going to be uniformly bounded independently of epsilon. So this is in fact bounded by the, the bound on u epsilon, the, 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 the L infinity bound on u epsilon plus the constant L. So we get a constant here, which does not depend on epsilon. But the price that we, we had to pay is that we don't have the two, but we have the one there, right? So we just put it back into the estimate and we get this term with the square that goes to the left-hand side of our estimate. And these two terms with the one that go, they have a minus, they go to the right-hand side of the estimate and we obtain uh, an estimate of this type, right? So this is the price we have to pay to have a constant that does not depend on epsilon here and here. So that we have an estimate that we can somehow carry over to the limit as epsilon goes to zero. So, I mean, for a person that works on this uh, on these problems, I mean, it's very nice to look at an estimate and see there, not only the main features of the PDE reflected in terms of the, of the analytical estimates, but also the physics of the problem. So when I look at this estimate, I see, so the P here means that I have a degeneracy in, in the PDE. And the one that I see over there is the trace of the singularity in, in, in the, the time part. Okay, so, and in terms of the physics, the P is the nonlinear diffusion and the one is the phase transition, okay? So this is, this is what I uh, summarize in this, uh, in this chart. 
So at the analytical level, we have a P in the estimates corresponding to the degeneracy in the PDE and to the fact that we are modeling a nonlinear diffusion. And the one is a singularity that corresponds to the fact that we have a phase transition. So if we just have the heat equation, we have no nonlinear diffusion, we have no phase transition, we would see only twos everywhere, okay? So now, how do we deal with these different powers? And for this, we have to use a method called intrinsic scaling. So instead of doing this reduction of oscillation analysis in the standard, say, parabolic boxes uh, that I represent here like this, where you scale r in space and r to the p in time, we have to do this in boxes that are adapted to the degenerate structure of the PD. So we have to stretch the boxes according to a factor A0, and we have to do the analysis in these boxes. So when we do this reduction of the oscillation, what we have to do is that we pick the standard boxes, we have to stretch them according to the oscillation of the solution there, and then we show the reduction of the oscillation, and then when we do the next step, we have to rescale again according to the oscillation. So this is a technical thing, but the idea is that to each PDE, you have to do the analysis in a geometry that somehow corresponds to the degenerate nature of the PDE. So the idea is that the stretching factor is something like the oscillation divided by a constant to the power two minus P. So you see, this is a very small quantity to if P is greater than two, this is negative. So this is like, in fact, a large thing. So we are in fact stretching the cylinder. And of course, for P equals two, again, we recovered the standard parabolic cylinders uh, with the natural homogeneity between space and time. So how do we deal with the three powers? So this makes the two, power, two powers compatible, but not three. So the price that we pay with this is that although all the approximating solutions are holder continuous, when we pass to the limit, we lose this holder character of the, of the solution. So the question uh, now next is, I mean, okay, the, 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 the limit, the limit uh, function is continuous. The solution to our problem is continuous. How continuous is this, uh, this function? And so what we know about the one phase problem, and this is a result from the 1980s, is that in the case of the Laplacian, the models of continuity has this form. So it's a log of one over R to some negative power that is unknown. And for the two-phase case, these are independent results by Caffarelli, Evans, and Dibenedetto, and Friedman. For the two-phase case, we have two iterations of the log here. So recently, together with Paulo Baroni from Parma and Tuomo Cusi from Helsinki, we managed to improve this in three ways. So first, we extended the result to the case P greater than two. But even in the case P equals two, in the classical case of the Laplacian, we have managed to get rid of one iteration of the log. So for the two-phase problem, we have a modulus like the modulus that was known for the one-phase case. And we gave an explicit expression to this modulus over here, okay? So now we have a much better understanding of exactly how continuous is the solution to the problem. Uh, this has been uh, improved by several people. For example, Liao extended our result to the singular case in the supercritical scenario. And uh, we can also extend the results up to the boundary. So this was known for P equals two, and we've extended with the same modulus uh, for the case P greater than two. And finally, let me conclude with uh, a very exciting uh, recent result by, by Figali, uh, Rosotto and Serra, who proved uh, that uh, finally, this was a, an open problem for a long time, that the free boundary for the one phase problem remains smooth for uh, almost every time. So if you, if you put a nice block in a container with hot water and you let it melt, uh, you can do this experiment with your kids around because if the kids try to grab the ice, there's no chance they're gonna cut their fingers because the, the free boundary never develops sharp edges that remain over time. So the, the, the free boundary is finally proved to be smooth for almost every time, okay? 
So thank you very much. That's all I wanted to say. So now let's uh, hear your questions. Hey, thank you, Professor Urbano, for this uh, very interesting presentation. Um, <clears throat> so we already have a question. Let's see. Uh, someone is asking about, uh, so how does the proof involving the estimates starting from the, the judge's iteration modify if we have a non-homogeneous problem with some known term f? Yes, very good question. So in fact, uh, we can deal relatively easy with lower orbit terms. So if we have terms of order zero, like the one you're mentioning, then uh, we can absorb them in the estimates in a, in a relatively simple way. So we know how to do that. We can have f, and we also can have some convection, for example, and have terms of uh, order one. And so this is not a problem. The method is uh, sufficiently robust to deal with this uh, with this uh, lower order terms in the estimates. So as we wait for more questions, let me say that I'm, I forgot to say at the beginning, these problems gained some momentum recently, of course, uh, in relation to climate change and global warming, because people now are pretty much interested in understanding how ice caps in the Arctic are melting. Uh, and so understanding this type of uh, of models is, is increasingly important nowadays. Now, you may think that uh, these are, of course, very classical problems. But uh, as I mentioned, for example, understanding the behavior of the free boundary, even in this one phase case, is something very, very recent. The paper is not even yet published. And uh, so this corresponds to our, I mean, common sense would tell you that uh, if you grab a block of ice, I mean, you're not going to find very sharp edges, but the rigorous proof that these models, the Stefan problem, uh, really uh, gives you a free boundary that doesn't develop this type of singularity is, is really a very recent uh, finding. And of course, for the two-phase case, this is, as far as I know, uh, pretty much open. So we know that, uh, I mean, the solution is... Uh, gives rise to a free boundary which is smooth except for a small singular set but uh, understanding the properties of this set of singularities for the two-phase case is still uh, I mean to, to a large extent uh, uncharted territory I see uh, so another question well it's uh, from me um, mm -hmm. So the, there's for the application of this theory to to uh, well global warming or, or, or analyzing the the ice caps uh, around the world, uh, you you need to analyze some inverse problems uh, to 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 gain some information and insight on what's happening or 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 not. How 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 does it work? Well, these problems, of course, you have to approach them numerically, right? So the better information you have on the regularity properties of the solutions to this, uh, the, the better you can develop your numerical al algorithms to approximate solutions, I would say. So the, the importance of understanding uh, how the solution behaves and how the, the free boundary evolves uh, in practical terms has to do with uh, implementing better numer numerical methods to, I mean, to, to come up with possible solutions to, to the problem, right? 